recording. Good stuff. <laughs> welcome, everyone. Um, welcome on this pretty dreary, dark morning. And hopefully this will brighten your day up a little bit. As Steve said, we've been on here for half an hour or so. And I've just been smiling the whole time. Paul's got some great stories. So um, it's going to be a good one. Uh, Steve's going to be interviewing Paul today. Um, but same again, if you've got any questions, just stick them in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll, we'll try and get through as many as, as we can towards the end. Enjoy. Steve, over to you. Thank, thanks, Libby. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, I was, I, yeah, I've been up um, preparing for this and I've, it's like meeting your old school teacher where you can't, you have to call him Mr. Moss or something. And I've been quite nervous about it, I'll be honest with you. Uh, so, Paul, I, I, I tweeted out actually while I was, we were promoting the webinars and I said that Paul's potentially the one of the biggest influences on on my coaching career it probably is the biggest because it was the first real role model i had i'm probably embarrassing now so uh i have to train myself not to run on about and reminisce too long about the introduction but i first met paul when i was about 12 i think and um there's a few other guys on the on the call today who also played played for paul's uh, representative team and we went all over europe with Paul, and, and he provided us with opportunities that we never thought possible um, and it's really, really shaped me as a coach and an individual. Um, and it's just fantastic that he's, that he's come on to talk to us today. Um, so welcome, Paul. Um, Thank you, Steve. If you could just uh, give us a, a bit of an insight as to where you're at at the moment uh, before we talk about your journey. Uh, OK, well, uh, I, I'm in Kazakhstan at the moment. I was uh, CEO, Chief Executive Officer of FC Astana. Um, not many people have heard of Kazakhstan and very few people would have heard of uh, the football club FC Astana, but actually FC Astana uh, um, are quite, they're rated 51st in, the Europe, in Europe in terms of uh, European results. And last year they beat, we beat Manchester United at home uh, 2-1, so it's quite a, a good club. Um, uh, but... Uh, after almost two years of being CEO, in the summer, we sacked our coach. Being totally honest, he'd lost the dressing room and it's difficult circumstances anyway. And I took over co as caretaker coach for eight games. We lost to our main rivals, Kairat, in, the, in my last game. And so they sacked me as head coach and CEO. So uh, that's football. That's what normally happens. But uh, I'd, I'd only honestly gone in it to, uh, to help out because... Uh, but I think out of the eight games, we won four, drew two, lost two. Um, uh, anyway, I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting to go back to my role as CEO. And uh, as in football, they, I would say they look for a scapegoat and uh, they sacked me from both jobs. So I'm still currently in Kazakhstan uh, looking for my next move. Uh, I've worked in five different countries on, on uh, three different continents. So... I've no idea where my next move will be. I'm speaking to various people, uh, but uh, with the COVID, et cetera, it's, it's obviously more complicated, but uh, I'll wait and see uh, where my next move is. Wow. Thanks, Paul. Presumably, you, is it, you have an agent, presumably? Is that, would your agent do all the, the work behind the scenes, or do you, you represent yourself? Uh, <clears throat> no. See, if you have one agent, especially as a coach, then... Uh, it's difficult for one agent to find a coach. There's hundreds and hundreds of coaches mm -hmm. or sporting directors or whatever out of work. So basically, I speak to a lot of agents and contacts and uh, send my CV. And if they can find me something, then they could become my agent. Um, but no, not limited to, to one agent. You can't do that, I don't think. Uh, it, I always say, and I say for players as well, it, better not to sign for an agent if an agent finds you something, then you can reward him then by yeah. uh, signing a contract with him. Um, but of my, I think it's 10 clubs now I've been at, uh, only once did an agent find uh, a job for me. On the other nine occasions, I found it through my own contacts. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks, Paul. Um, so we're going we're gonna to kind of, Run through your journey. I've put some slides together um, to kind of sort of some visuals for everybody. So, are you okay to just talk to us and reminisce a little bit about where it all began? Now, 
um, you, well, I'll let you talk about it, but I just remember you, you went to college at NORCAT, which is now the College of West Anglia, and then created this half soccer school, um, which was kind of unheard of back then. We were talking 26, 27 years ago, maybe. So you're right to just tell us a little about, a bit about that, how that came about. Yeah, sure. Uh, um, I'd, uh, I'd been on a similar thing, a PGL uh, football school um, when I was 14. And that was, uh, uh, and then I'd also travelled abroad uh, with someone called Kit Carson, who was in charge of the PGL and, and been on quite a few tours. Um, and then when I was at 17, actually, and at Norcat, between uh, between my first and second year, I decided in my small village of Buxton in Norfolk to do a non-residential football school. That was before uh, football in the community, before any kind of football camps. Uh, only there was residential summer schools or sports schools, one of which I went on with PGL. And uh, I just did, just tried it, put some posters up around my village and the surrounding villages and ended up getting uh, 40 kids uh, to the, to a week's long uh, football school. They paid 19 pounds each, I remember. And I made 700 pounds out of that uh, summer. And remember that's between, that's being a student. So for me, this is over 30 years ago, right. 32 years ago. For me, 700 pounds was a lot of money. So I bought a van. I remember I bought a van, did, did, did the next year at uh, uh, Norcat, finished my A-levels and, uh, Got into Liverpool University, actually, okay. uh, but decided to defer for a year and try setting up past soccer uh, through with more venues. And that's when I, I think we had five or six venues in the summer. Um, and then each year, the venues got more and more and the business got larger and larger. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the, the guys and gals who are listening in today, I'm going to be seeing the recording, are in the coaching world. So... Are you, did your early experiences kind of shape you as a coach or are you, are you completely unrecognisable now from, from back then in terms of belief, styles, values, would you, would you say? Um, well, well, definitely. I, I, people don't change that much, Steve. Uh, I don't think it's possible for people to change that much. So I would say I've got the same values, although the last ooh, 20 years, I haven't been working with children. I've been working with adults. So uh, you have to adapt with adults. Um, you know, you're not going to tell a 30-year-old international footballer uh, that he has to go go to bed at nine o'clock and you go in to check his room to see if he's in bed. Um, and uh, you have to rely on their professionalism. Uh, so, So obviously you have to adapt and I have adapted and um, in some ways be less strict with adults um, uh, but in other ways you could be more strict because if they break the rules then you could be fining them money so which you you can't do with children so you just have to adapt I think basically the principles are the same but has to be different for men's teams and and each team and each country you have to be slightly different so uh in the answer to your question i don't think i've changed that much <clears throat> but i have adapted to each situation yeah great thanks paul and excuse me you said kind of your the ill started with a kind of an idea of little little buxton and this this um soccer school on did you have at that time or maybe a year down the road did you have <laughs> short, medium, long-term goals, or was it simply a case of, I'll see where this might take me, uh, not expecting to end up in Kazakhstan <laughs> talking to us? <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, do you know what? I, uh, that's a difficult question. I, um, at, at the time, I wanted to do coaching. I wanted to be a football coach, uh, having experienced it myself with PGL and travelled myself. That's what I wanted to do. So at that time... I was focused in what exactly what I wanted to do, but to have goals, no, I don't think I did uh, have goals. I think I just uh, let it flow really to from one situation to to the next situation, and was very ambitious. And when there's an opportunity, tried to 
create a, a new opportunity or try and take the opportunity that I felt was in front of me. Thanks. Um, great. So, so then on to, um, I'm, I think I'm right in saying, but correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, your first kind of role in professional football, would that have been at Cambridge United? Yeah, that's right. With the uh, past soccer representatives teams, of which you were, uh, Steve Stuart Williams. I'm not sure if he's if he's on sure. here or not. Is Stuart Williams on here? I'm not sure. I can't see the list now. Libby, can you right, see okay. it? Uh, anyway, okay, yeah. Um, uh, uh, Matty also, uh, w uh, Damien, you mentioned was going to be on here. With those teams, uh, we. Uh, Cambridge United didn't really have a youth policy at that time. This is before Sense of Excellence, is before academies. And uh, I was asked to, to take all the past soccer teams over to Cambridge United and basically become their under-16 youth setup. Ah, right. Um, and, uh, and I was given a budget for a year of £5,000. <laughs> so my budget for my first year at Cambridge United, that included my salary. Wow. Um, I was still running past soccer, uh, but the budget was five thousand pounds, and so. But we still, I think, with every age group, we went on one or two trips a year abroad, um, and uh, and then it started to develop. And then the following year, they asked me basically to come full time, and uh, um, by the end, five years, eventually, I was at Cambridge United. By the end. Uh, um, the budget was funded, the youth budget was funded a lot better. I would hope so, yeah. <laughs> um, and there's some interesting, uh, well, I think actually that it's stupidly it's cropped you out of this photo, Paul, but can you see the photo? You've got, um, certainly in coaching world, we've got Gary Johnson there and Tommy Taylor. So yeah. were any of the, so could you tell us a bit about their roles at the club and any other coaches and, and also maybe some players that went on to play in, in the professional game? Okay, well, I, I I went to the club when John Beck was there. Right. Uh, John Beck was manager. Uh, John Beck's uh, one of the most successful managers in uh, in English history, if you look at statistics. He took Cambridge United, a little club, from Division, or what is now Division 2, up until the playoffs of the Championship, where they lost to Leicester in the semi-final of the right. playoffs of the Championship. So he was the first. Then John Beck left. Gary Johnson became caretaker caretaker coach. That's why I developed really, really close relationship with Gary. And uh, I think we'll, we'll go on further to speak about Gary. Yeah. Um, and then after Gary left, uh, well, there was a coach called Ian Atkins that uh, uh, came in. Then Gary became coach again. And then uh, Tommy Taylor became head mm -hmm. coach. Brilliant. I remember, I remember it well. And then um, you kind of, Cardinal Sin, and you went over to arch rivals Peterborough. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, at well the then. time, yeah. At the time, Kit Carson was academy director at Peterborough. Okay. Um, I played for Kit at uh, uh, PGL. Helped him with his when he was at Norwich City with the, some young teams uh, coaching, and uh, um, uh, I moved from. Uh, he asked me to come to Peterborough as youth co youth coach. Uh, so again, no, we spoke, to, spoke about agents later. It wasn't uh, before. It wasn't about agents. It was about personal contacts. So then I moved over to Peterborough after five years of being at Cambridge and moved from youth development officer to uh, under eighteen youth coach. You had a bit of success, Paul, didn't you, with the FA Youth Cup? <clears throat> yeah, we had. A, we had, I was lucky. We had a very good team. I took a couple of players over with me: James Campbell and uh, Matthew Gill. Um, and uh, um, and it, it, we had a really good team. And uh, the second year I was there, we we got to the semi final of the FA Youth Cup. Obviously, wow. Peterborough Division Two two team, um, and that was a sensation in Peterborough at the time because uh, I remember when we played the semi final, the second leg against Blackburn, we had five thousand, a crowd of five thousand, and the first team were only getting about four and a half thousand. Um, and so it was a great, a, a good run, but we did well in the league. We did well result uh, wise, but obviously results are nothing to do with, it's an indication, but the main thing is to get players uh, into the first team. And I think of the second years at that time, 
we had 10, nine out of the 10 signed professional contracts. So that was the result. Absolutely. You mentioned Matty Gill. He's actually a guest in a few weeks' time, Paul. Um, so you have to tune in on that one with Matthew. So he, Matt, Matty's um, gone from player, I'm sure you know, to coach recently. Is in, so coaching in, for Ipswich Town, assistant manager. So he's going to talk to us about the transition from player to coach. So you have to tune in for that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be really interested. Uh, <clears throat> funny, Steve, you, you, you tell me, like, for me, you, you're 40 and Matty, I don't, I, he just had his 40th birthday, actually, yeah. Gilly. But about what, 10 years ago, or maybe five years ago, when he finished playing, uh, and I kept, keep in touch with a lot of the players through Facebook and, uh, and I'm chatting, and I keep in touch with you and Gilly, he came over to Latvia with Norwich City under 12s or something to play in a tournament. And I was in Latvia at the time, and I met him in Riga, said, let's go to a pub. So we went to a bar in the evening, and uh, he asked me, is it all right if I can drink? <laughs> Oh, wow, bless him. <laughs> he, he was like 35 at the time. I couldn't believe the question. <laughs> so what are you talking about? Brilliant. You're a coach. Yeah, That's you brilliant. Better do. I'll remind yeah. him of that. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just before we move on from Peterborough, I'm a, and again, I'm, a, I'm right in thinking that you actually ended up as assistant manager. Yeah. So your role has developed and you find yourself assistant manager of the first team. Is that right, Paul? Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> obviously, after the success of the under-18s. The following year, we joined the academy. Peter, we were, were in the first year of the academy. Mm. <clears throat> and we were playing Liverpool. Steve Gerrard played against us one time. We drew 2-2 with Liverpool. Steve Gerrard scored two. Played against Everton, beat Everton 5-1 uh, in one academy game. <clears throat> and the players were doing re really well. We had, we'd had sold two players uh, to Sheffield Wednesday. Um, David Billington and Mark McKeever the previous summer. Um, and then uh, Matthew Gill, Matthew Etherington, Matthew, uh, Simon Davis were getting into the first team from my youth team. And then Barry Fry asked me to become under-19 coach and reserve team coach. So I was doing both, both jobs, reserve team coach, and learning how to uh, coach with men, uh, basically. Or, and I was reserve team coach. Yeah. Um, we we did well because Barry had about thirty five players uh, pros, so we it was only the professionals we were playing against younger team younger players. But it was Arsenal, it was the southeast counties, I think, or southern counties we played, and we did well in that in that league. And then I think it was Jimmy Quinn was first team coach at the time, and he left. And Barry asked me if I'd become first team coach or assistant manager, if you like. How did you find that? Were you, was you, you were ready for it? You, you grasped it? Uh, you, well, I thought <clears throat> at the time, uh, yeah, I thought I was uh, ready for it. I'd done all the other aspects and I'd been working with the pros with uh, the reserve team as well. Um, <clears throat> possibly I'd do it different now with more experience. I'm not sure. But uh, um, we, uh, I, I, we finished the season mid-table. Uh, I'd done, I was there for three or four games, I think. And then the start of the season, we went by November or December, we were top of the league. So, uh, and, and Barry gave me full uh, uh, license to do the coaching during the week. He, Barry would hardly had, ever turn up at training. Um, and uh, I, I did full the system and everything to start with. We played 4 3 3, which at that time in Division Two was completely different to. Uh, the way other teams were playing, and uh, we went top. Um, uh, so, uh, so to start with, it went really well. Do you want to? I mean, I remember, you have to talk about this if you don't want to. I remember I was an under nine coach at Peter at the time, Paul. Uh, so I was with Stubbsy coaching the under nines, and um, mm -hmm. I loved it. And we used to get tickets for the first team. And I, I do remember being a, a lot of people. I mean, you're talking more than four and a half thousand people mm -hmm. now watching the game and, and I'm sure I remember the crowd singing Paul Hatchworth's Blue and White Army. Did that go down well with Barry <clears throat> Fry? <laughs> <clears throat> no, I think that was my downfall. <laughs> <clears throat> I think after that, because I, I think the crowd, we, we played 4-3-3 with the U team and uh, okay, 4-3-3 nowadays, everyone said, yeah, what? So? Yeah. But at that time, all that level team were playing 4-4-2, get it forward, squeeze, press, 
Um, <clears throat> now, now uh, we played a little bit more of a passing game and we had a few U team players in the team. So we played 4 3 3. So I think the crowd understood that I was doing the coaching and uh, the system was the same as the U team the year before. So once they started singing that, then <laughs> maybe before, I don't know, but the attitude of Barry changed towards me and within about two or three weeks, I was sacked. Football's a funny old game, as someone said. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so this is fascinating. So <clears throat> I guess La Latvia was the next destination. And um, <clears throat> I, I think I know myself, but uh, how, how did that come about, Paul? Why Latvia? Okay, <clears throat> so I was still in touch with uh, Gary Johnson. He's, he was a good friend. His son, Lee Johnson, who's uh, currently Sunderland manager, was also playing, <clears throat> also played for me in past soccer and oh, later nice. came to United. Lee played in Gillies' team. Did he? Lee was in the uh, Gillies' team, yeah. Oh, Won that. the Canary Cup with, with uh, Lee, Gilly, Foxy in that team. <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> Gary, uh, <clears throat> Gary was la the national manager of Latvia at the time, and I hadn't heard of Latvia at all. Uh, it was before EU and no one had heard of Latvia. <clears throat> so uh, Gary uh, invited me. He said, there's a team in Latvia who's looking for an English coach because Gary had helped them in the summer, coaching for a week, <clears throat> and they wanted an English coach. So I flew over to see Gary, really, in uh, in the November and uh, and then had an interview with FK Ventspils and uh, ended up going back in uh, in January to become manager or head coach of uh, FK Ventsports. But it was thanks to Gary, it was through Gary. Yeah, yeah. And do you, I know it's difficult now because you've probably, you've been out, you've been abroad for so long, but do you remember at the time whether there's a big change or, or sorry, a difference in culture, footballing culture, when you went over? Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a big difference uh, between a, a, a lot of difference, good and bad. Um, first of all, the players, uh, football-wise, the players couldn't really accurately pass over 30, 40 yards. So they were playing short passes. So you had to adapt adapt to technically and uh, tactically to, to what they were and were able to do. Second thing, they were unbelievably disciplined. So they were, it was like coaching a past soccer side again, <laughs> a, a children's side, that they would listen to everything you said. Uh, through a translator at the time, I didn't speak Russian, um, but through through my second coach who translated. And then they would literally do everything you said. But obviously, when it comes to men's football, you need them to have initiative and adapt. And, uh, and uh, but, you know, they'd concede a goal and they would, you'd then question them and say, no, coach, you said do this. Okay, uh, fine. So that was a, that was a, a negative that they didn't have as much initiative to start with. And so I had to adapt to that. But positives obviously is discipline wise um, was easy compared to an English team that, that at the time, the English team, obviously the humor, the laughing, the yeah, joking, yeah. Discipline, discipline off the field wasn't anywhere near as good as uh, when I went abroad. So did that's really interesting. So did you adapt to them or did you try and, encourage the players to be more uh, I think you have more initiative and be more kind of um, independent <clears throat> yeah uh, <clears throat> I mentioned to you earlier that I'm writing a book at the moment and uh, I'm on that I'm on the, this period in in the book because I'm halfway through writing the book but uh, so so I it jogged my memory about a lot of things but I remember the first trip we went on a because in Latvia like most of the northern hemisphere, um, from the, the season is from March to November because it's too cold to play in December, January, February. So uh, the teams meet in January for a three months pre season where they can't play outside. So we go to different countries, all the Soviet, ex Soviet, and Scandinavian teams do it. And you go to different places. And, and uh, I remember our first trip when I first arrived was in Cyprus. And I remember. Uh, in the evening, doing competitions like table tennis, pool, darts, quizzes, whatever, because I thought I had to keep the players entertained and right. uh, uh, like we do in English yeah. players. 
But no, they just thought I was crazy and uh, <laughs> they did it because I was coach. But uh, then after a while, I realised, no, they just go back to their rooms and stay in wow. their rooms. They're quite happy with that. So all through the two years of, uh, two and a half years of Ventspils, I was trying to develop a team spirit and initiative. So I did lots of different things to, uh, to try and do that, which I'd learned on my past soccer days with, as kids, how to develop people and kids' personalities and uh, using their own initiative. So it's similar to, in a way, without patronising them, it was similar to teaching English kids of 14, 15, just cutting out a little bit Paul if you need to change your internet oh. independent you're back just lost you Paul are you right to change your internet bear with us folks is that better yeah that's better mate yeah we can hear you now. I think. Steve, that, I think that's a mistake to change my internet. I've got oh, back it? on the phone. Okay. Yeah. No, we've got you yeah. back, mate. We've got you back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, yeah, you would. We. I think we got to the, just the fact that the players. You, yeah, you. You talked about how you try to create lots of stuff for them to do, and in the end, it was about patronising them. It's kind of like working with a group of young players. That's it, kind of where yeah. we got to. I think. Yeah, mentally, mentally, not physically, mentally. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's brilliant. Um, so I'm very conscious of time. I want to get through all of this. So you went from Latvia over to Russia and then back to Latvia. Is is that something you want to is there anything you want to tell us about that? Or should we do a whistle stop tour of that? Or how did that come about? Uh, okay, well, well, quickly, uh obviously I, I'd learned Russian by the time I was in Latvia and uh I got offered a job as sporting director through an agent. Uh, uh, this time, I think that's the one time I, I've used an agent, or he he approached me, and uh, I went over to Rostov and was sporting director, and then head coach for two games. Um, so you, you'd think I'd learn from my mistakes, wouldn't you? Uh, because the same, exactly the same, happened at Rostov as has just happened at Astana, um, and then uh, I, I left Rostov. But it, it was interesting because it was in Russian, so there's many of the cultural ex-Soviet uh, uh, cultural similarities in Rostov, but there was a lot of difference as well. Okay. Um, uh, Russia's bigger, more ruthless, more yeah. uh, hard, um, but more friendly and uh, more welcoming uh, right. okay. to, to, to Latvia. Once you get to know the Russians, then they'll be your friends for life and really okay. loyal, really, really loyal people. Interesting. Really interesting. So you're back in Latvia, before we talk about complete cultural change again, where you go somewhere else, um, would you consider that for your, your home, Paul? Uh, yeah, I've got a house in Latvia. I met my wife in Latvia. My three kids were born in Latvia. So in between jobs or from one to another, I often go back to Latvia. Yeah. Uh, if you look at my career and gone this country, come back to Latvia, that country, come back yeah. to Latvia. Possibly because I've finishing a job I moved back to to Latvia and then happened to get a, a job at another club in in Latvia um so in a way I would consider it my home but I think after living in Kazakhstan I'm not too sure if I'd want to go back and work in Latvia I think okay. I'd work want to work now somewhere else not Latvia interesting and finally before I okay, came before we move on I don't know if you, I'm sure you have a bit of an insight but I'm, I'm intrigued I was intrigued as to what coach education looks like in other countries. So, you know, the, the coach education goes through the pathway of the qualifications. Could you tell us a bit about that? Well, okay, so when I am when I was first there, it was 2001, and it was virtually non-existent. But right. uh, because of UEFA, uh, and UEFA fund each country, they fund uh, Latvia, I think they give them 7 million euros a year, and part of that money has to be sent, spent on coach education. So right. uh, um, I would say, and I think this is a huge mistake, but I would say that the coach education is very, very similar in Latvia than it is in England, but just a, numbers wise, a lesser scale. So they have the same, 
um, the same system. Uh, I don't even know what you have. UEFA. We have a level. Well, who knows at the moment? Uh, yeah, level different, one. Different, level yeah, level one, level two, up to UEFA, UEFA B, B, UEFA A, right, pro, that's pro right. license. Yeah, they, they have exactly the same system as you do in England, but uh, on a lesser scale. <clears throat> and they often invite guest speakers. I've been a guest speaker a couple of times to come and speak um, and uh, and have uh, UEFA assessors come in. And uh, I know Paki Bonner went over <clears throat> to help and uh, um, they get foreign people in. But uh, I, I think it's a massive mistake myself to... Uh, all the countries to do the same course and same coach education system because how can Latvia compete yeah. if they're going to do the same as England? They can't because yeah. you have to be in Iceland that do something completely different yeah. if you're going to uh, compete as a smaller country. That's a great, interesting point. I hadn't thought of that. That's a great point, yeah. Thanks, Paul. Um, so... Again, as I said, a complete cultural change again. Am I right in thinking the next move was out to Nigeria? Yep. So um, uh, I finished at, finished at Skonto. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I finished at Skonto and then uh, I actually through the LMA, the League Managers Association, <coughs> I had an interview in London for a job in Nigeria. Uh, and uh, then went out to Nigeria and ended up being there for four and a half years. And how was that? I, I think it's similar to, I think it's similar to Latvia. Honestly, in Latvia, I thought I'm going to be there for six months. Right. <laughs> uh, because I was taking Peterborough United to court for my contract and the court case was going to finish that June. Um, so I thought I'll just go out there to the court case and come back to England. Ended up being there well, all my life on yeah. and off. Um, and Nigeria, I thought, oh, I'll go and do it for six months until I get another job and ended up being there four and a half years. <laughs> so did presumably you, you took the family out there and you didn't leave them behind for no. four and a half years? Really? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. no, 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 no. Uh, I uh, The family stayed in Latvia. My right. son was one. My youngest oh, right. son was one at the time, so it was quite difficult. But yeah. uh, it was an, uh, an academy, um, residential academy with 100 players and 100 staff. Um, and we had the summer, we had two months off in the summer, one month off at Christmas and one month off at oh, Easter. Wow. <laughs> so right. each, each period I would go back. So basically I was four months with my family in Latvia and eight months in Nigeria coaching. Wow. Okay. So we've talked about cultural differences in football in Latvia and Russia. I mean, uh, so many good players coming out of the African countries, but culturally, working with players, anything you can tell us about, about that? Nigeria well, yeah <laughs> yeah I mean Nigeria they've got some fantastic players and fantastic uh because they play on the street they they haven't got iPhones they're mm -hmm. uh, really poor 200 million people predicted to be 450 million people and the third largest country in the world in 2050 wow. um and and uh um the the boys just play on the street and you can, and when I say the street, it might be a dust bowl, like in the 1960s, uh, our parents moaned about what, how they played, etc. But, <laughs> and they're literally out there for two or three hours. Obviously the weather's fantastic. So they, they and they're literally out there for two or three hours. And uh, so technically, because they are every single day for hours, uh, um, technically they're superior to European uh, players and then physically, although uh, often some are malnutri uh, have malnutrition and don't eat the right things, what they do eat is uh, completely healthy. They don't have fizzy drinks, they don't right. have chocolate, they don't have snacks. They eat what they can get hold of, which is meat and potato, yam, rice, chicken. Um, and so they're and playing outside two or three hours a day, their bodies and physiques are perfect. You don't have any worries about that. Mm. I remember year, a few years ago, I think LA actually predicted that an African nation would win the World Cup, and it hasn't happened. It, would you say it's the tactical kind of, or the psychological side of the game, Paul, that needs still needs to be developed? No, 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 no it's a, the, the organisation in right. the African countries is. Uh, 
useless, oh. completely <laughs> useless, and uh, and completely corrupt oh, as okay. well. So uh, if FIFA sends seven million, I don't know how much they send to to Nigeria, then the <clears throat> Nigerian Federation will be only working out how that seven million can get into their own pockets, not how it can be spent on developing uh, young players. So it is simple corruption and organisation um, that has, has stopped and will stop an African country from winning the World Cup. So presumably you had your own battles with that kind of thing, did you, Paul, when you were there? You know, I could tell you many stories. But, uh, <laughs> That'd uh, be in the book. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah. And, um, the Nigerian, I, I loved it, my time in Nigeria, and the Nigerian people were, were brilliant. One Look, you've gone again, Paul. I have to start that story again. Yeah. Right, we're doing better than... Considering Paul's in Kazakhstan, we're actually doing better than we did with Tony in um, Minehead. <laughs> so we're doing all right. We'll come back in a second, I'm sure. Keep firing your questions in, guys. It's, it's we've got some it's questions. Yeah, we have, yeah. Paul, are you there? No, no, you no. Oh. <clears throat> Sorry, Paul, we lost you yeah. now. <clears throat> uh, am I back? Yeah, yeah. you're back now. Yeah. <clears throat> but they they have a in Nigeria, they have a thing that if they can trick someone out of money, then that's an acceptable thing. <clears throat> so uh defraud, if they can defraud cleverly, then they've just been more clever, and that's acceptable. Really? Oh that, that <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, it's my summary, it's my experience. Yeah. Something <clears throat> the total opposite of the English mentality, which is defrauding is uh, the biggest criminal offence you can pay for them. Yeah. No, no, I've just been more clever than the other person. <laughs> Again, cultural differences, <laughs> isn't it? So, so I could tell you stories uh, <laughs> about corruption and uh, my experience of it, uh, but it would take too long. Oh dear. Okay. So then... Uh, Back to Latvia again. Um, I guess on this part, Paul, but by now, I mean, a lot of the guys listen to the girls listen to this are in the coaching world, but you've, you've taken on a series of different roles. Would you say that you're, by this time, when you're back at Ventspils, that your skill set has developed to way beyond being just a coach on the grass? Yeah, yeah. The idea of going back to Ventspils was that using my Nigerian connections, I would uh, get Nigerian young players, we'd develop them, we'd sell them, increasing the budget at Ventspils, which was going okay. down and down each year, okay. which we did. I got three or four African players, two of which uh, were sold. We got them for nothing. Right. They're on 1,500 euros per month salary. And uh, we sold one to Zurich for... 450,000 euros, I think, and one to uh, Zurich in Switzerland and one to uh, Norway, uh, Starbecken for start. So he start in uh, Norway for 700,000. So we, uh, we, we did it. We developed them and sold them uh, on. But that was the idea was I was not only a coach, but you like uh, an old English manager, really, uh, in charge of the finances and uh, working to a budget and selling players and get, and uh, trying to increase the budget. And is that part of the role that you enjoy doing or do you still like to be on the pitch or a bit of both? Or? Uh, yeah, uh, well, yeah, I, I enjoy doing that. I, I, I think at this time in Ventspils, I enjoyed the emotion of being a head coach because uh, obviously your, your emotion is when you win a game then you're in ecstasy and uh, when you lose you you're on the floor but uh, I quite enjoyed that roller coaster coaster emotion of being a, a head coach and then uh, and uh, I think I could I could continue to do that I think I could continue being a head coach but equally interesting which is what you're going to talk about next is uh, Kazakhstan it was a completely different role that's interesting before we move on to that, so it's interesting what you say about you enjoy the role of coach to, of the winning and the losing. So when you're a head coach and you lose, does it 
does it ruin your, your day, your week, your next three days, affect the family, that kind of thing? Or can you can you park it, Paul? Yeah, well, funny, funny for me, for, for me, uh, when I lose, <clears throat> I'm on a bit of a high that evening. Um, because I think a coach has to put on an act to the players that it's not all doom and gloom and they need to be positive for the for the next game. And so I put on an act for, uh, after the game. It's not an act, actually. I get adrenaline from it and uh, I actually feel that and think of the positives and, uh, uh, um, uh, um, and that evening I'm OK. It's the next day it hits me. So the next day... Then, then, then it hits me, and then it's probably for a day. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't say I'm depressed, but down. Um, and if the family are around you, you, then you have to really act to to be a normal dad. Um, and although you might do things, it's still on your mind. You're still thinking about the result the day before and going through uh, the match. And then the, the next day, you have to act again on the training ground in front of the players. And then by that time, I'm normally over it. Right. And then presumably, I don't know, when does the planning for the next game start? Does it start immediately after the loss? Or, or do, you, do you go through that kind of period where you don't think of the next game? Well, <clears throat> by the time towards the end, by, by Venspools and a little bit before, then I would plan the whole season uh, at the beginning of the season. So the whole training schedule would be planned uh, in January. I would know what training session I was doing in November. Um, <clears throat> uh, so so the training sessions were planned. Uh, okay, you could adapt them. Uh, but no, I would always forget about the last match. I wouldn't right. work anything on the last match. Okay. And all that week, all that week would be gearing up for uh, the the next match we could could be on a Wednesday or could be on a Saturday. Great, thanks, Paul. We, I think we've got questions, so we'll we'll move on to well the kind of the kind of now and then what next, and then we'll leave a bit of time for questions. Is that all right, Libs? We've got a few questions. Great stuff. So um, you've you've touched a bit on uh, Kazakhstan uh, and the fact that you you you've made this mistake maybe of sacking the manager, taking it on yourself, and then no longer there. Um, so you're currently in Kazakhstan, Paul. What I guess I've asked, we've touched on this at the start, but are you open to anywhere, or would you like to stay in Kazakhstan? I've actually put the Union Jack there. Will you come home one day? <laughs> uh, well, uh, Kazakhstan. No, I don't think there's any chance of staying because I love the country. Of the five countries that I've lived in, Kazakhstan is by far the best uh, for for living, for the people, the culture, <clears throat> the facilities. Uh, I mean, uh, um, restaurants, etc. Kazakhstan is by far the best. Uh, but I don't know. I can't say where I'll be next uh, because <clears throat> I never guessed I'd be in Latvia. I never guessed I'd be in Nigeria. I never guessed I'd be in Russia or Kazakhstan. So <clears throat> I just have to wait for the next opportunity. Um, that might be England. That might be China. It might be America. It might be back in Latvia, Africa. I don't know. I just have to wait and see right. when the next opportunity is. You can't plan in that no. situation. When I know you return to England sometimes, obviously to see to see Dan and to see um, I know you visited Lee Johnson, I think recently. Do, do you get? Does it feel like a, an itch that needs to be scratched to come back to England, or or not? No, not at all. No? Not at all. No, I don't think uh, um, England would be nice because my family are there, and England obviously has the best league in the world in the Premier League. There's no dispute in that. But uh, um, my next position is the job, mm. not the country. Right. So I would want to get the best job possible. And if it's uh, that's in England, great. Uh, but in another country, yes, but it doesn't feel like, I don't feel drawn to come back to England right. uh, as a country. Right, I'm with you. And, and lastly, you may have already answered this, apologies if you had, seeking a new job are you seeking a job where you can wear a tracksuit all day or when we can wear a suit all day or a bit of both <laughs> either either um uh, again it'll be <clears throat> look i've been head coach sporting director head coach technical director of academy head coach ceo so each time my job has uh, changed i think if you limit yourself to one option then you limit your chances of getting to work Great shot. 
Thank you, Paul. Uh, that's brilliant. Really interesting. Uh, Liv, you've got some questions in the chat box. Yeah, there's been some uh, <laughs> questions firing in. Um, the first one is, would you advise uh, travelling abroad as a young coach to gain experience? Um, there seems to be a high number of success stories of British coaches going abroad lately. So would uh, you advise... Yeah, I would definitely advise. I would say, uh, I would say you have to do it. If you, anyone gets an opportunity to coach abroad as a life experience, you have to do do it. One thing that I found is that uh, you think you might be successful abroad, and it'll be easy to come back to into England um, because you've been successful and you've done, you've got, you gained the experience. But it's not. It's not easy to come back into England. The English. Uh, in general, don't look anywhere abroad. Just a very, is an island nation, um, which, uh, um, in football terms, they look internally. And to have been, I don't know, a youth development officer in Cambridge United seems to have more clout than if you were a CEO at Astana or a manager in uh, Rostov in the Premier League in Russia. Um, so don't be surprised the difficulty of getting back. Um, but as a life experience, you have to do it, you, I think. You, you have, if you have that opportunity, then you must do it. Sweet. Um, another one, which is pretty, pretty broad and a very good question. Is there one piece of advice that you've been given during your career um, that you've never forgotten? And can you share that? Um, okay, there's lots of uh, different pieces of advice. Uh, one thing I'd say, if you're working in another country or another team, you have to adapt to the team. The team doesn't have to adapt to you. Or the, you have to adapt to the country. The country doesn't have to adapt to you. So you have to get in quickly to that new team, that new job, and you have to adapt uh, quickly. What, whoever you are, uh, you have to adapt to that situation and don't expect everyone else to adapt to your ideas. You can slowly introduce your ideas, but only after time. Um, so that's probably the one piece of advice for working, working abroad. And in general as well, coaching, head in coach. General, uh, in, in general... Oh, it's a great, that's a great question. So many different pieces of advice. But uh, in general, I would say uh, Richard Branson once said this, uh, that if you get offered a job and you don't know how, you, how you're going to do it, do it anyway and adapt, similar to what I said before. But what I'm trying to say is live life out of your comfort zone. If you live life out of your comfort zone, then you will become a bigger person. And if there's a job you're fired, can I do it or not? If you get uh, offer that job, do it. And then understand if you can do it. Don't wonder about it. So good. Libby, yeah. that's like you when I asked you to do the social media stuff, wasn't it, Libby? <laughs> said, I've never done that. I went, well, crack on, you'll be all right. <laughs> yeah. See what happens. <laughs> good stuff. Uh, another one is speaking of Nigeria. If there was a magic wand, um, what could you what could you adopt from there that might enhance the development of young players in England here, if anything? Ooh. Uh, I don't know. I could have a magic wand of how to develop Nigerian football. That, that, that's an easier question. But uh, I, I think that in Europe and in England, uh, there's not enough initiative of, I touched on it before, of countries trying to develop their own way. And obviously, I, I don't want to sound old here. I am old, but I don't want to sound old. But uh, when we were kids, we were playing in the garden and the street, etc., uh, and getting in the hours individually, two-on-twos, one-on-ones. And I think really Nigerians do that all the time and that's why they're technically and physically more gifted really if there's a magic wand I would 
try and come up with something where kids, especially younger kids, can develop themselves without coaches or just with supervision where they can be encouraged to just play at their early early stages of life before they go quickly into organised uh, football, organised coaching, organised times. Um, just be able to, to play and learn themselves. That's good. Very good. Um, by, the, by the way, that's impossible to do. What I've just said will never happen. <laughs> it will never happen that kids will go out on the streets because uh, um, kids don't do that now. But that, if I had a magic wand, I would go back to the time when kids could play more outside, less on their iPhones and less structured, organised football when at a younger age. Yeah. That's like me think. talking that. I, I bang that drum a lot, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> It's um it's on the street as well. You've got bobbles all over the shop, so you're having to react quite quickly, aren't you? So, um, <laughs> another one uh, going back to Nigeria. Knowing what you know now, do you think you could have a positive effect on the football out there, or do you think the organisation challenges would prove too much? You could only have a positive effect if you're high up in the organisation in the or the. Uh, decision making so you you uh, I when I was in Nigeria for three and a half years we had an administrator who was in charge of the academy and a technical director me who was under him after a year I found out about his corruption reported it and I became uh, in charge technical director and administrator of the whole thing and uh, then uh, changed the academy so there was no corruption you, that, that's one academy in Nigeria that has to be done all over Nigeria and from the Federation so you can only uh, have an effect if you're at the top otherwise people will try and kill you, they'll try and uh, push you aside if, if they feel that you're affecting their own financial gain mm. Yeah Tricky um, as, as CEO would you see the play as much or is it more of an office job um would you get your hands dirty or would it just be um in front of a computer yeah, as, as C ceo my main responsibilities were the transfers of in and out of the players for the players so i did all the signings in and out uh, and i at new players i would fly over to meet them in their country or where they're playing at the time meet them and their agents so i would get to know the players a lot of the players were english speaking who came over to uh, astana uh, so they would also use me. Uh, they would also phone me if they had a if they had a problem. Uh, and then I would go to every game, go in the changing room before the game, wish them good luck, or after the game, say hard luck or well done. Um, and also uh, meet the coach, the head coach, one, once a week for a cup of coffee and uh, to see to support the head coach basically. Uh, so so I was and I travelled. I went went to every single game. Travelled all over Europe because we were in the Europe, Europa League, so went to many different countries um, uh, and stayed in the hotels with the players and the staff. So, uh, so I was, yeah, I was really, I was close to the team. Good stuff. Cool. There's one here. I guess this goes back to your first past soccer stuff um, and then wherever you've been. Since then, are the children that you coach uh, are they essentially the same all over the world, or are they what? What are the differences that you you see uh, when you're coaching young guns? Uh, I think I, I, funny enough, in Latvia, when I was at Skonto, I had a Brazilian coach who was an assistant, and then when I <clears throat> after I moved left Skonto, went to uh, Nigeria and came back. He uh, wanted to set up a, a football school, like a football camp, like I'd done past soccer. So, uh, so me and him, just for one week a year, for like five years, we had in my village close by to where I lived in Latvia, we had a, a Brazilian football camp for Latvians. And I found, uh, apart from the language barrier, because they all speak in Latvian and I could only speak English and Russian, I found the kids almost the same as the... Uh, kids that I'd coached on past soccer many years ago. So I think kids 
kids are kids uh, in any country and it's how you shape and how you react to them and similarly how their parents do. The only difference now, of course, is iPhones and social media and computers because uh, certainly I've got two sons who are 14 and 11 and they spend far more time on their computers and iPhones than I ever did. Right, okay. are they into football, Paul? No. No? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. Is that, do, you, yeah. is that, do you quite like that, that you can switch off with the lads? No, no, I'd love it if they were into all right. football. <laughs> uh, but uh, my first son, I, I tried to take him to football and uh, he wasn't bad, actually, but uh, then he was going three or four times a week and he was six, six or seven. And uh, then I went to Nigeria, he lost interest. Right. And... Uh, Fine, I didn't want to force any of my kids into doing something they didn't want to do. So we played a few times in the garden, but they're not really interested in football. Yes. Going back to the um, the language barrier, are you just a wizard at learning loads of languages, mm -hmm. or is that does that take a lot of time? No, no, no. I only speak two languages, right? English, obviously, and uh, Russian. And Russian Russian took me about three years to learn. Oh. Um, uh, so, and it was really difficult because it's a different alphabet. They've got 36 letters, completely different alphabet, and uh, Russian was really difficult to learn. Yeah. Uh, so, no, I'm not a wizard at learning languages at all. It, uh, it's just I've been so long in that area and had to learn. I was forced to learn Russian because one club I went to at Riga didn't have any English-speaking staff. So that, that situation forced me into it, and then obviously it's developed since then. Good stuff. Cool. We'll soon wrap it up. Paul, is there anything you want to finish on? Anything you want to add to what we've said that you just think, oh, I could say this? Or... Uh, no, I don't think so. I, uh, obviously, if there's any, it, obviously, it's great to see Steve again. And uh, um, I don't, I am really interested in how kids or players that I've developed, uh, that or I've worked with over the years, what they're doing now. So uh, um, good luck to Steve and everyone on this course. And uh, I hope it's been interesting. And obviously, if there's any more questions, then at any time I'll be able to help or answer. Great stuff. Paul, that's, been, that's been great. And um, guys, as you heard, Paul is writing a book, so stay tuned. <laughs> um, it's going to be cracker. Uh, other than that, guys, we're going to wrap it up now. Uh, we will see you on the next one, which is, Steve, Monday. 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 With Sally Needham. It's not too oh. late to book on. So um, do get in touch if you haven't done that already. Paul, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Great to see you. Okay, no problem. Listen, uh, there, there's some questions here on Q and Q and A. Yes. I think uh, we've asked them, have we? Yeah, uh, although you've all asked, you've asked all of them, yeah. There's a few that we couldn't quite get towards the end. There's a oh few. no, 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 no. I can see, I can see. Okay, okay. <laughs> there's a few. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just saw the Q and A now. Okay, no problem. Okay. Yeah, yeah. sorry if we couldn't answer your questions, guys. We've ran out of time. There's one question I just read about visas. Yes. It's difficult to get visas. Uh, no, no, it was easy to get visas, but now because all of you have voted Brexit, <laughs> then you're going to find it a lot harder. Sorry. You had to get that in, fine. didn't you? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, it's true. It's true. That's going to stop a lot. Yeah. Brexit is going to stop a lot in football, a lot of travelling. Yeah. Right. Well, thanks again, Paul. I've got a whiz. I've got a 10 o'clock. I could have stayed on forever okay. talking to you. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Paul. Okay, no problem, Steve. Yeah, Keep in thanks, touch. Thanks, Paul. I will. I'll give bye you a shout. Bye, Libby. Thanks for your help, Libby. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Libby. Trap.